as architects can be profitable in any different aspect. If we have enough work, there's no reason not to be profitable. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today I will be speaking with Lior Sharbel and Yotam Kedam, who are partners at Precise, a leading financial management and control service provider for architectural engineering and law firms. So Yotam leads the New York office and Lior leads the international services. Precise was established more than 25 years ago in Israel in 1996, and they started to provide international services in 2011. They assist their clients in increasing their business efficiency, improve their key performance in indicators and maximize their profit. They do this by defining the firm's objectives according to industry standard KPIs. They measure the firm's performance according to the financial objectives set by the practice or the firm. Um, they look at project management and control processes and billing projections and staff allocation according to these financial indicators. So this was a really brilliant conversation. I really enjoyed speaking with uh, Yotam and Leo. Uh, we discussed a lot about the different issues that architecture firms face with their financial reporting and the problems that result as you know, not having our eyes on the ball. So in this conversation, we look at cash flow issues and what's really causing them uh, and how to avoid them. We discuss key performance indicators, what they are and which ones are relevant for you. And um, both your Tam and Leo give us a, a lot of context here for actually how we should be looking at key performance indicators and how that is related to the objectives and the mission and the goals of the practice. And we ask the question, is it really a collections issue? So one of the problems that Yotam and Leo and us here at Business of Architecture, we hear a lot is that we've got a collections issue and Yotam and Leo dig a little bit deeper and explore, is that really the problem? So sit back, relax and enjoy Yotam and Leo of Precise. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Yo, Tam, Lior, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you both? We're good. We're good. Uh, happy to be here. <laughs> Very happy to be here. It's great to be here, Ryan. Excellent. Now, we are straddling time zones. Yo, Tam, you're in New York. Correct. And Lior, you're in Tel Aviv. Correct. And you are both partners in at Precise. Uh, which is a, a company that specializes in really helping architects and businesses in the AEC industry get to grips with their finances, their financial tracking, their kind of capacity planning, utilization, all this kind of wonderful world of um, important financial metrics, which are often left a mystery to many architecture businesses. You guys actually help take control of that and give you know, deep insights into the business. So I guess the first question is, how would you describe Precise and how did it come to be? So Precise established 26 years ago in 1996 by uh, mm -hmm. uh, Nir Sharmi, is uh, the founder of the firm and the two of us are, are the co-managing partner today. And it's actually kind of a nice story. It started, uh, his, his father, Nir's father, actually owns a road engineering firm in uh, Tel Aviv. And he just, you know, Neil just wanted to help his father to take this practice or professional services uh, practice and make it a business, like a business, mm -hmm. business out of it and, and deal with all the finance and all the things that uh, all AAE firm, design firms around the world are struggling with. And it was so wonderful. So... In a short while, friends come to the father and ask, can you do the same thing for me? Um, I joined Nir in 2001. And Yotam joined us in, 
what was 2008 2008 we have uh, eight more uh, nine more partners in precise mm -hmm. and I, th I think uh, basically that, that that's how it started um, I don't remember the, the beginning of the question <laughs> No, that's, that's, that's perfect. How would you describe what Precise does nowadays? So I, I, th I think at the end of the day, Precise provides uh, financial services for uh, AE design firms. But mm -hmm. it's not just finance, because um, one of the things that is one thing that is unique about Precise that we we are over working almost exclusively with uh, designers and architects, uh, interior designers, engineers in this industry. And we find it uh, one of a very unique business. It's uh, one mm -hmm. of a kind. And we truly believe that in order to help an architectural firm or design firm to be more efficient, or more profitable, you need to understand the nature of the business. So we are not a general consulting group. You, you won't find precise walking with all kinds of uh, firms from different type, different industries. So I think that's the first thing. I think this is what we are doing for the last 26 years is really mm -hmm. working with AE firms and, and understand the nature of the business. And I think this is part of the strength that we're bringing with us. Mm -hmm. And our goal, our ultimate goal objective is to take a practice or to take a, a firm and made it, uh, make it a uh, efficient and profitable unit that not just providing services, not just being very professional, but also have financial objectives, working with KPIs, decision-making process is related to those KPIs. Every decision in the business is basically connected to the objectives of the business, the KPIs mm -hmm. we set up. And the same thing regarding project. Basically, we have two models, okay? We are talking about managing the firm, make sure that the objective we set up according to efficiency KPIs uh, yep. the firm is meeting the objective. And on the other yeah. hand, the really the, the ongoing uh, monitoring of, of every project, starting with the proposal, mm -hmm. make sure we have the right language of the, of the proposal, right fee, right metrics, right rates, all those kinds of things. And mm -hmm. After that, really monitor it on a monthly basis, make sure that we are basically where we, when we are working on a project, it needs to be invoiced. We need to connect yes. the money to the time that we're spending. Yeah. Well, what's, what sorts of problems then do you see with architecture firms and their, their ability to, to invoice and their cash flow? So, so I think, um, Obviously, there's there's a lot of different uh, uh, problem, but um, it can you know vary from you know the uh, the ratio sometimes between the staff and the number of projects. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have a lot of projects, and uh, again, maybe not as much in architectural, but when you talk about you know structural engineers and MEP engineers, there's a lot. The volume of projects can be substantial, mm -hmm. and you really need a way to uh, to control it uh, and 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 to be on top of it. It's 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 very difficult. Uh, that's one of that's one of the issues. Um, the second of all, we have to understand that project managers um, have a lot of different things on their plate. Um, they need to manage the client, and the client is not always easy to manage. Um, they gotta they gotta have the design done, and and they're very focused on the design. They gotta manage their staff. So the financial aspect of the business, from invoicing, uh, but also staying on budget, you know, uh, making sure we're not overspending and all of that. That is not usually the top priority, and it's not because of something they're doing wrong, because there's a lot of different things on their plate. And when it's just mm -hmm. left for them, when it's solely their responsibility, um, it's usually not getting done in um, a timely fashion or uh, let's say an efficient uh, fashion. And I think that's kind of what, you know, we really want to help is kind of take them hand by hand, work with them together make their life easier so they don't need to like do all of this analysis and they need to figure out and all of that we kind of come with them with the numbers get their insight mm -hmm. of the projects and then make these decisions uh together um i think that's 
kind of a real part of it. The other thing is really um, scope creep, which is, um, I don't want to call it a disease, but it's something that happens a lot in in this industry. Um, And as I said, we have these busy project managers and sometimes A, they don't maybe know the scope, you know, to, to the details or what is included or what is not, but also they don't usually stop and think, is this additional services or is it is it not? Um, and really the fact, you know, somebody to work with them closely and to talk to them and to understand what's happened and to say, wait, is this additional services? Are we sure we're doing work, you know, outside the scope? And if so, we need to say it now and not wait till mm-hmm. the work is done because you just put us in a, in a tough situation, right? Versus the client asking for money after a work is done. So I think obviously we're touching kind of the tip of the iceberg when we talk about, you know, issues or, or problems uh, within a and firms. But I think that's one of the challenges. Uh, Got it. I think, so, I think another challenge is basically the, the nature of the project. Uh, we think that it's, you know, it's not just people say that uh, because architects and, and, and designers don't like to deal with finance and the, the, they want to avoid it. This is why they're, would love to have somebody like precise, but I don't. I don't think that's that's the main reason. I really we believe it's a very complicated business to run, and the mm-hmm. nature of the project. When we're starting a project, we don't know exactly how complicated it's going to be. We don't know exactly the length of the pro of the project. We don't know so much thing. You know, every time when you start a project, when you do the the, the fee quote, the fee proposal, you try to estimate how much time you're going to spend. But nobody really knows. This is what, and, and as Yotam said, we have, usually we have dozens of projects to run. At the same time, each one have uh, uh, the specific pace. And we need to be on top of everything. And I think if we would have the ability, if architect would have the ability to know exactly how much time they're going to spend, that, that would be easy. But that, that's not the case. So you mm-hmm. need to solve it in, in, in d- different metrics. And I think the metrics is, as Yotam said, is to be on top of every project every week or every two weeks or every month and see how much time we spend, why we spend it, and connect it to, to the money. And, and, and I think it's a, uh, uh, as I said, it, it's a complicated business to run. And I think mm-hmm. you need a strict metrics in order to, to manage it. That's very interesting. You know, it is a complicated business. And, you know, a, a lot of the times when an architect agrees a price for the project, they're doing so at their at their risk, because it's at the point of the project where they know the least amount about the project. And if you get yourself into a commitment where particularly if you're using a fixed fee, and if you haven't got any data to sort of, you know, to look back on how you're setting your fees, this this becomes quite a quite a problem. So how exactly do you help architects? What sorts of tools um, do you empower architects to have so that they can have that kind of detail analysis or knowledge of, of, of how a project's profitability is moving along? Um, yeah. Uh, so I think one of the, um, one of the, the, it starts from basically phase one, uh, which is pricing the project. And as you said, we have to look at metrics, you know, um, depending on the job type, if it's percentage of construction, dollar per square foot or square meter, um, and all of these aspects, but also to understand how our history, the firm's history, or like, you know, the specific architect's history, you know, what is our product that we're given? How long does it take us? Because we have to look at internal and external uh, factors when we decide uh, the fee. So that's something we also help, you know, the, the, you know our, our clients with understanding. That is the first step. Uh, I would say it mm-hmm. sounds complicated, but it's probably the simplest step along the way. After that, we have to monitor on a monthly basis, you know, the time we're spending, which we help with our tools, uh, sitting with our clients on, and every project manager, we meet on a monthly basis to, to really see how the budget, how we're spending the budget versus the, um, uh, uh, the yeah. actual versus the budget. But also, it's a discussion. What happened this month? What are we doing? Let's understand because we need to really control uh, the scope creep. Sometimes the project becomes bigger 
when it becomes bigger, it's easier mm -hmm. to ask for additional services because it's more straightforward. The client understands, mm -hmm. you know, there's more work. You guys need to do more work. It's a bigger project. Great. But sometimes the project stays the same, but there's redesigns. There's additional things that are being mm -hmm. added. There's certain complexity that wasn't mentioned in the beginning. Sometimes it's certain um, approvals that you have to take, that you have to get that weren't mentioned initially. Um, all of these different things um, sometimes get, you know, are introduced later on. And it's really important um, that we are on top of it, that we communicate that, you know, to the client so they know, okay, you want us, mm -hmm. you know, you, you want us to do this job, that's gonna take additional fee, right? That is the uh, kind of, where we think it's it's very important, uh, we always say um, additional services and additional fees. It's not to make we like we don't want to be profitable mm -hmm. on the additional services. We want to cover our cost. We don't want like you know we, we, if 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 what we thought the project would be was exactly the project yeah. never happens. But if let's say that is, we don't need additional fee. But we just want to cover the cost, and sometimes it's. Mm -hmm. unexpected things that we didn't know. Sometimes it's clients' decisions of what they want to do, you know, if it becomes from the marketing aspect that they want to change or from different things. So again, we believe that it's not just reporting mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, reporting is one thing, but it's a discussion and while looking sorry. at the numbers. I, I think what you thought mentioned is, is very important. You ask about tools, Ryan, but it's actually not the specific tools because you have a lot of software that you can have the information. And we hear a lot from architects. We have all the information and the team leaders or the project leader, they are not using it in order to take the decision. They're not going to use it. That's not, it's about the process. And I think, it, and I think precise services is not a tool. We're not going to coach you how to do it. We're going to do it together with you. It means mm -hmm. that we are sitting with, we are meeting with every project leader, everybody that is in charge of a project every month. And we basically, their uh, business hand and ask them, as you Tom said, we are, we are asking them the question. We, we discuss it together with them. We connect what happened in the professional side of the project to the business side. But at the end of the day, every project is a business center. And yeah. that's, that's a process. It's not just tools and information. Mm -hmm. that's, that's very interesting um and also what you're talking about what you were saying there as well about that for something like scope creep that you're not looking to make profit on the scope creep but if you've got the profit baked into the original services then you're going to be in a healthy p um, position um do, do you have any suggestions then for how architects should be setting their fees and setting their their profit and and, and, and how does this process that you're, you're talking about kind of get involved into that? Yeah, so I think pricing is almost like an art um, mm -hmm. or um, with some science behind it. Uh, so what, what I mean by that, we have the metrics. We have, we, we know, you know, as I said, depending on the job type, you know, we work, if it's private residential, multifamily, institutional, uh, public, all of these different aspects, um, Mm -hmm. need different type of metrics and, and they usually calculate differently. Um, and by the way, the clients are aware, uh, meaning the ones that get out the RFP, they usually know how, you know, the architects uh, mm -hmm. charge and do the metrics. So you have to understand the market rates, uh, but you also understand internally your, your, your cost. So you have to say, okay, a similar job, how much it took us. And then we say, okay, we can think, you know, market wise, we can get, I don't know, I don't know, A, um, we think it's gonna cost us B, where we have something in the middle here, a room. If it's if it's the other way around, it's mm -hmm. a problem, right? If our cost is higher than what the market can bear, it's a different problem. But I think to that also, there's more factors. For example, how busy is, you know, the firm right now? Do we have enough work? Um, can we take on more work? Um, do we need work to keep our, our staff busy? All of these different things have to factor in that, that scale. It's maybe not going to be substantially, but all of these really take into effect. And also understand, for example, um, knowing who the clients are. Um, some are more receptive to additional services. Some want a fee. And to get an additional service from them, 
you know, if it's sometimes public agencies or certain clients, yeah. it's almost impossible. You have to bake that into the equation that even if there were changes, you're not going to get. So, as I said, there's all of these factors have to be uh, taken in. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. sometimes what firms do is they have the metrics that they've been either been using for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. They go by that. Um, and they don't take all of these other factors into the situation. Um, and and they're like we always say, like if the industry is very busy, there's a lot of work out there that maybe gets very busy. The industry is slow, mm -hmm. slow, but they, they are not controlling maybe their mm -hmm. fate as much as, as they should. They're not controlling their profitability as much as they should. Mm -hmm. And um, again, we, we don't wanna be like, you know, a leaf that like takes us wherever the wind blows takes us. We want to gain control of our business. We want to control of our firm. And, and again, as I said, all of these phases from pricing through additional services and all of that, in order, we have to be very focused uh, on all of these in order, you know, to sustain um, kind of uh, profitability and financial health for the firm. So when a, a practice is working with you, may they come to you with different projects then and you would be setting aside different profit targets for each project, depending on the sector, depending on the, the length of the project, the risk involved? Uh, absolutely. You know, uh, every, 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 uh, every firm needs to have some kind of branding, some kind of you, you, you won't, you're not going to be a profitable business if you only uh, compete on price. That's never gonna happen. You need to be somebody, something that you are better at than somebody else. It, it can be design, it can be the, the, the professional solution, it can be the service, it's gonna be, sometimes it's, it's a lot of things, so, but you need to see where, where, where are the fields that you are better than other, and, and then you need to price it accordingly. And one of the things that we, we help our client is really, to find they they place in the industry and help them help them is pricing which is which is very very important it's it's different project type uh sometimes even different project as Lior said because you know for example there's a certain project that we believe mm -hmm. can build the resume uh can can get us exposure we'll we'll maybe price it a little bit differently uh but it also goes into diversification uh we're going to have different um different profit margin on different project types, you know, uh, it's kind of almost well known as which jobs usually are more profitable, which are less profitable. Um, but also, again, sometimes we go to firms and they say, well, we had two project types we were doing. One was more profitable, the other was not. So we just focused on the more profitable one. Mm. Sounds like a very business minded decision, but it's a wrong one because yes. diversification is, is important. Uh, diversification is a price that you're willing to pay because a you want to be risk averse. If you know c certain job types, we you know we had a recession in 08 and we had obviously COVID. Uh, when we saw different you know job types, different markets react differently. So profitability is not the only way we look at which jobs we want to get. Diversification is important, but also some of the less profitable jobs tend to be also the more stable ones. And that is also very valuable mm -hmm. to, to a firm. Maybe the projects doesn't look as profitable, but what it adds to the company's profit and the ability to keep the staff and the ability to take mm -hmm. on jobs that maybe are more profitable, but don't come in as frequently is very important and is uh, is worth a lot of value. So um, that, there's all of these different things that you know, we need to look for kind of a strategy or from kind of form like a business model, um, more kind of big picture, but then everything has to, you know, like every step of the way has to be looked at. And, and again, it's not just making those big decisions, but it's going to the project, pricing it, making sure additional services, making sure it's being invoiced, making sure it's being collected. All of these different things have to be taken care of in order to achieve profitability. When you say you're looking, um, you know, stability of a project is actually very valuable to a firm. What does stability mean in this context? So, mm -hmm. for, for example, we might have projects, I'll just say government projects, that might take five years. Um, the profit margin is very low, but as a firm, it keeps a certain staff, you know, busy for a certain amount of time, which means you can sustain a certain level of, of firm, right, uh, level of, of staff, which basically means that um, 
overhead is distributed more evenly over the staff. And, and again, if that project maybe wasn't there, mm-hmm. then we couldn't afford the same level of staff we have right now. And therefore our margin as a firm would be lower. So a stable project, obviously we don't want it to be a losing project, but even if it's a smaller margin, it gives us, um, it, it gives us, you know, uh, kind of stable income and enable us to be in a certain size and therefore achieve you know, from the other project also, a certain profit margin. And if you can be in a position that you have both public project and private project, you can avoid crises because sometimes crises affect the government project and sometimes the, the private. So that that's a stability that is very important. By the way, so, you know, sometimes you said, okay, I don't, I don't if I ha- will have less project and the workload will go down, I can cut my stuff by 50%, but then you need to remember your overhead per every hour is, is, is going up. So, so we need to think of, as we said at the beginning, we need to connect the firm to the project and every decision is affecting another one. This is why it needs to be a live process of monitoring the firm and monitoring each project and each new proposal on any given time. Right. Let's talk a little bit about cash flow into a business. So this is kind of you know, kind of going on that idea of stability in a project. And architecture is a very famous industry for it being you know big swings in cash flow, or the money is very clumpy. We might say, how do you help a practice eliminate these kinds of swings in cash flow? I think it starts first of all. Uh, it start when the firm is is have the right profit margin mm-hmm. you can afford to have a month or two months with less cash so mm-hmm. we need first step make sure that the firm is not like two three percent of profit for sure you're going to be in, in in a disaster with, with cash flow so this is the first step one of the most important thing is to we said we need to connect the billing the invoicing to the work that we are doing every month Need, we, need, we need to try and, and invoice every project that we are working on every month. And the billing, mm-hmm. you know, the, your time always said that the collection hit all the, get all, all, all the hit, but it's actually billing. Because if we can be sustainable and every month have the more or less uh, amount of billing, the same number more or less, we're going to be sustainable and it's going to be mm-hmm. more or less the same number uh, with cash flow. So we'll have another month. If it's a profitable firm with a monthly billing, uh, we want to, as much as we can, to try and meet the uh, objective every month. And I just, we sometimes start to work with, with a firm and they said, okay, I'm, I'm doing billing every three months. This is crazy. This is crazy. <laughs> and, and, and you can see those huge jumps. And of course, it's going to affect cash flow. Cash flow mm-hmm. is all you we need to remember. Cash flow is after billing, billing, and you need to have a billing projection, and you need to meet your billing projection, and you need yeah. to take the, the decision regarding operation according to that. So one of the things that we are doing, we're doing staffing, and we do. It's not just a projection; we call it a work plan. You need to work according mm-hmm. to the projection in order to do billing every month and to have as much as you can uh, you can a stable uh, billing every month. Just to kind of add on what Lior is saying, um, there are a lot of times there are cash flow problems for for A and E firms. Uh, it's very common, um, and every time we go and we meet a firm that you know has a cash flow problem, they tell us, "Well, we have a problem with collection." From our experience, collection is rarely the problem. Ninety percent of the cases, it's not collection, but as we said, it's the last piece of kind of the puzzle, right? You first, you know, in order to collect, you need to bill, Mm -hmm. you need to to invoice. In order to invoice, you need to have the work, you know? So, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes there is, obviously there's not a good collection process. We have a lot of firms that don't really do collection, right? They just send an invoice and hope to get paid. So you do need to have a collection process, but you need to have a billing process and you need to make sure you have yep. enough work. And what I mean, we have enough work if we signed enough contracts and when we say, what is the number, you know, with this metrics, you know, what is the, ba- what is your backlog should be? What should be your projections? And if you know your projections, and you're staffing according to mm-hmm. the projections, that means that you are billing more than your expenses. And if you're billing more than your expenses, 
does it for a hundred percent to make sure you're not going to have cash flow problems? Maybe sometimes you will, but it eliminates eliminates them uh, a, a lot. So we really want to make sure that you know we are uh, planning uh, according to really you know projected projected fees. And uh, yes, there are some projects, as as Leor um, really said, there are firms that do quarterly billing, and there are some projects you know, especially the public ones that you cannot bill every month. So we, if we're only working on those public ones, yes, it's sometimes more of a challenge. But when you are billing quarterly on all jobs, yeah. it's not only cash flow. It's also additional services, right? If I am waiting for a phase to be completed before I bill for it, if there are any changes within that phase yeah. that I should have asked additional services, I'm not going to ask for it. So it is a imperative and it's important, even if it's a small mm -hmm. percentage, that we bill every month according to our progress. Because if we are at 50% DDs and all of a sudden there's a mm -hmm. schematic change, we're going to say, listen, you already paid us for 50% DD because we are there. Our package is there. Now you ask me to change the design that's got to be additional services. So I think it's, it's really processes. So the process is, you know, projections, it's invoicing and only it's then it's it's collection, which unfortunately gets the better app in this uh, industry. But again, it's it's rarely uh, the problem. Yep. Got it. So so actually, rather than it being a collections problem, it's a, it's a problem with well, it's either you haven't got enough projects in the first place. Yeah. Coming in, that's what's causing the issue. That's why there's there's um, and also if they haven't been baking in enough profit and setting the fees right, yeah, that's also going to cause a big issue. Yeah, and and as I said, like the sometimes we need to look at all of these factors. Are we signing enough contract? Are we billing enough? And then are we collecting enough? Now, if we are billing enough and we're not collecting enough, then yes, it's a collection problem. Um, if we are signing enough work and we're not billing enough, then we have a problem here. We're not. Either we're not producing enough, we're not efficient enough, or there's additional services that are being missed because we are working, obviously, but we're not producing and there is work to be done. Um, but if there is not enough work, then we just don't have enough work. So it's important with a firm because we always get this question, what is the most important number in an architectural firm? What one number should I focus on? There isn't one number. You know, If you are only focused on one number, you missed it, you know? So it, you have to look at different numbers, different metrics to really understand where you are and then make decisions accordingly. Yeah. It, interesting you were saying about uh, the, the practices who might be billing quarterly, okay? And how that's that's a pretty dangerous thing to be doing. And it's not uncommon. I've heard, I mean, I've heard architects in the past, you know, they've, they've said it's a collections issue. You probe around a little bit and then they say, well, actually, we haven't billed the client for six months. And it's like, well, okay, that's a problem. Um, and and obviously billing by milestones puts your cash flow at a very vulnerable position because a milestone can be moved by the client. As you say, scope creep might end up meaning redesigns happening or that there's planning issues. So if it's going to be, if, if you are, for example, taking on those institutional projects where you're not allowed to bill monthly, how do you how do you kind of bridge the gap then on that kind of thing? Is this going to be a case of making sure that you've got enough diversification in the portfolio just to be able to float a project like that? Yes, yeah, so, so we, we, we would advise to have the, uh, this uh, uh, to at least a uh, few kinds of project. If you have just one kind of project and you also need to see, as it I'm said, one of the things that to monitor our firm, when you monitor it on monthly basic and you discuss the issues, you need a flow of projects. Okay, so Yes, sometimes, even if you have the same project and, and the same type of project, if you have a flow of project and you're omitting your uh, objective of getting your project, and then you will have a flow of, because you're going to do schematic design with one project and did it uh, uh, in other project and construct and document in other project. Therefore, you will have you need to have enough project and enough uh, volume in your business to meet to, to meet those objectives, so that's the first the first thing we look at is actually the, the backlog, the the how much workload do we have. Backlog is the remaining balance in in, in signed contract. Then it is to see that it's not just one number. We need to see that we are meeting this number 
on a monthly or at least a quarterly basis. Again, getting enough project is super important. Uh, it's not just one number. If I have one huge project at the beginning of the year, that's not enough. I need to have this flow. Um, I w- the second thing, as you said, is the diversity, to have a diversity, try to have different type of project. By the way, also different sizes of project. Okay? Sometimes you have, you, you, you're, you're taking like uh, the smaller project, or, or if I'm talking about uh, maybe there is a, the project that takes a long time, but they're very profitable, to have what Yota said, a stable project that basically going to cover the, those months that you can invoice, it's also help. And, and you need to, you need to do all those kind of things. And one of the things regarding invoicing and not invoicing every month, so it is harder with public, of course, with public and institutional project. It's something you, you you cannot do anything about it. But one of the first thing that we are doing, Yotan uh, spoke a lot about about the fee proposal. You have a lot of things in the fee proposal which are not the fee that are super super important is the language, what do, what, what's included, what excluded. And we see every time we start to work with, almost every time, I wouldn't say every time, but a lot of times that we started to work with architectural firm, we see that they're missing some of the language. And then after a few months, after a year, when the project is, is, is you know, have those things and it happens in, in reality, you cannot go back to the, to, to the uh, proposal because you didn't have the right thing that protect you along the way, because you're going to spend time on, on change orders. It happens in at least 80%, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, of the project, if not 100%. And if you don't create yourself the right language in the proposal and the opportunity to go back and say to the client, listen, this is exactly what I said in item 10.2 that's going to happen, and I'm going to charge you for it, it's a different different world than try just, okay, I need more money because I'm spending time, which is sometimes the case. And, and, and one more thing is we are, you know, uh, striving for diversity. We're striving to get, you know, uh, we call that the fillers, right? Not just the big ones, but also the small fillers jobs that enable us to, you know, helps us with cash flow. But even in a firm, that's only working in, call it, institutional public jobs that are being built by Milestone. And they're telling us, okay, our problem, we're not profitable or we have cash flow issues because we can only build at a Milestone. That is not the case. That is, that, that's not the reason you have a cash flow profitable or it's not because of the Milestone. Because if you think about it, you know, if you have 10 projects, you know, and you pro- bill everyone every three months, or even if you have three projects and everyone you bill like once every three months, every month, you're going to have a big invoice that, that's coming out. So it's going to kind of average itself out. Maybe the first three months of the life of the firm, you have a cash flow issues. But after that, you have a lot of different projects that bill at Milestone. Cash flow is, is going to be okay because we're always getting these big payments. So if you are still struggling, that is not the, the reason the reason is your your jobs are not profitable enough uh, and they're not profitable enough because as we said scope creep or pricing or anything like that so it's as I said like the um, the technical aspects of a business if it's uh, collection if it's the milestones and, and and all of that they are rarely the issue of the lack of that profitability. Lack of profitability starts with more foundation stuff, which is pricing and the processes in in the firm. We can be, as architects, can be profitable in any different aspect. If we have enough work, there's no reason not to be profitable. None of these things should hold you back from being profitable. If, if, you, if the decision-making process is connected to numbers on real-time basic, you should you should make money, and you should you shouldn't have a cash flow issue. So, so what, what for you? What is the biggest obstacle for profitability in a practice? Where do you see the biggest leaks and eaters it's, of profit? It's easy, not enough work. It, we we always said you know when, when we start to work with a client, you know I have we are working with one of the the most uh, landscape architect uh, in the world. And she asked me when we started to work together, 
what can go wrong if I will work with you guys? Is, is it is it a, a sure thing that I'm going to be profitable and, and have money? He said, only one thing. You need to bring the work. We, we can't help you with, with bringing in the work. Once you have enough workload and all your other uh, decisions regarding the project and the firm are connected to real time, not just information, but numbers and processes, there is no reason why not uh, uh, to be profitable and to have a uh, relax and a uh, nice uh, cash flow. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's uh, as Lior said, workload is for us the number one issue that we see for lack of profitability. Uh, but, you know, it's also the willingness um, to, to, to have these processes in place, the willingness to um, kind of factor business aspect into a project. Um, we, um, again, project managers, uh, as I said, they are being trained to deliver our projects. They're being trained to deal with a client. They are not being trained um, to really, you know, uh, make sure they meet the budget. The ability to work with project managers and the ability to uh, train them, uh, educate them, and work with them together uh, to have kind of more of a focus on the budget mm -hmm. of, of the project from the firm aspect. Because uh, that is also something that we think a lot of firms are struggling. Their project managers are not focused on profitability. Yes. Yeah. So we we spoke a little bit about collections. Collections not really being the main problem, even though many architects say that it is. What about when it is the problem? And for example, late payments or past dues. And this is something that we, we see a lot of, and sometimes it can be really serious. I mean, we're talking um, people having hundreds of thousands of unpaid invoices, and then they're just carrying them. And this can go on for a, an enormous amount of time. Um, usually it's some sort of developer who hasn't got their financing and then the architect kind of continues working on and the developer says, we'll pay you on this one, we'll pay you, we'll pay you. And then to kind of keep the architect sweet, they say, here's another project. And then the same yeah. thing happens again. And if we're not careful, then we've got a little client here that's... Yeah. It's, it's um, like the, fam the famous the uh, joke about the architect that said he had two two problems. The one number one was that all the projects are, are losing projects, and number two that they don't have enough projects. So. <laughs> I I think collection obviously is it's also a process, so it needs to be a process. Um, yeah. uh, you know, we say here the the squeaky wheel, uh, you know, kind of gets uh, gets the oil. So, you know. If, if you need to be, you know, in contact with the client um, when things, again, every firm is different. Every country is a little bit different in the payment terms. For example, in New York, 30 days is usually uh, the accepted terms. It's something over 30 days. We've got to treat it for collection. Mm -hmm. And if it's, you know, emails, phone call, escalation to partners and et cetera. Um, the one thing that you know, when you're talking about these developers that don't pay and are willing to like not pay for, um, you know, for, for a long time is architects, unfortunately, at some point need to pull out the card that they have during a project, which is stopping work. They have to be okay to stop mm -hmm. work and until they get paid. You have to remember, you are not supposed to finance the project that is up to the developer. You're not a bank. You're not, bank. Yeah. You're not supposed to finance. You should feel okay stopping it. It doesn't have to be in a nasty way. It has to be is, listen, mm -hmm. your project is not paying me. I have to pull up the staff that's working on this project to another project that is paying me. I mean, there's nothing I can mm -hmm. do. It's not, I'm not punishing you. It's just the fact mm -hmm. of, you know, economics, you know, I have bills I have to pay. I have payrolls I got to do. So we got to, we got to put that, you know, uh, and do it in a way that's maybe not as a, you know, offensive, but you have to be willing mm -hmm. to pull that card out. Yeah. So, so we said before yes, that you absolutely. need to connect the, the money to the time that you are spending. The client needs to understand it as well. There, there is no other way. I think one, one another, another thing that we must do is, and we talked about it, is make sure that in your proposal, in your contract, uh, you want to have the mobilization 
uh, you need to have a party of payment. Everything needs to be in writing. You can't be in a position when you send three um, invoices to the same client and, and, and they not pay. It, it, it cannot mm -hmm. it cannot be. And as you were saying, we cannot finance our, our client. And another thing that is very, very important is you need to know to understand your client and try to know about them as much as you can. Uh, different countries have different culture, different payment system, uh, getting money from China or, or from Saudi Arabia. It's not the same thing as getting from, from London or, or, or New York. And you need to understand it. Sometimes, you know, you have a great project with issue of uh, payments. You, you're going to know that you're going to get paid after only after 90 or 100 days. You, you, you need to take it mm -hmm. into consideration in, in your pricing, in your in your phase, payment phases and all those kind of things, it needs to be, you need to have a very good understanding. What is the project that you're going to do? What is the clients that you're gonna work with? And it all needs to be in the in the uh, proposal. It needs to be there and it mm -hmm. needs to be in the contract. Once it's there, usually the issues are uh, much less than if it's not there. Is this something that you're, when you first start working with a business, you might do an audit of their clients and the diversity of their clients? Yes. Yeah, so, so uh, first of all, like a risk analysis, if you like. Say, say it again. Like a risk analysis of the types of projects that they've got on in the in the business as a first audit. Yeah, well, one of the things that we are, again, it's not, we don't believe in one time thing, you know, it, it is one of the yeah. first things that we are doing when we start working with a, with a, a client. But even if you are, have a great client, you need to see how is your uh, revenue distributed between different clients. If you have one great client, amazing client, the best client in the world, but 80% of your income <laughs> is based on this specific client, that's an issue. That's an issue. If it is a AAA client, you need to have a distribution between clients. You cannot be dependent on one client, even, even if he's they are the best in the world. So yes, we mm -hmm. are doing risk analysis, but as I said before, we need to do it every month. Every month it's a living right. creature. Architectural practice is a living creature that needs to be fed, fed every month. Yeah, and I think analysis is important. You know, obviously we want to understand, I mean, for us to really, you know, the first thing we do as Lior said, is we analyze the firm, understand the, you know, for, a lot of different aspects or all of the aspects of the firm. So it's, but it's step one. And then you got to have a continuous process and, and, and make sure you, you continue on it. Well, what for you are important performance metrics so that you can really tell the health of a business? Are there ratios that you like to look at things like, you know, net fee against um, full-time employees or, um, profit rates what, what what are the sorts of metrics that you like to look at as a group or some of the key ones that you would pull out to, to kind of ascertain the health of a business yes. so you have a few uh, kpis key performance indicators that it's super important to um, revive revise and monitor on a monthly basis or, or even more than that the first one going to be of course uh, the income per uh, technical or professional uh, employee how much do we have a mm -hmm. 10 employee firm. What needs to be the revenue every month or every, every, every year? Uh, or if it's 20 or 25 and, and, and et cetera. We, this is one is usually the, the, the easiest one. And again, you need, you need to know the, in, the industry benchmark. One of the first things that we are mm -hmm. telling our clients when we start working with them, if your colleague is doing, for example, X, why you need to do X less 20%. So usually the reason is, is efficiency is is all the things that we discuss yeah. it's not uh, it's not other thing because if we we're usually going to compare one apple to apples it means if the branding is the same you need to have more or less the same income by the way it, it it's you know it's a myth that the high rise project are the most profitable it's it's not necessarily the, the case mm -hmm. you need to be efficient it doesn't matter what project you you are doing um, and so, so, so this is, uh, this is basically the first one. The second one is we also look on the structure. What is the ratio between the revenue that we, we need to have and 
the, the, the money that we are spending in producing the work, which is the professional employees. So this ratio is very important mm -hmm. because sometimes, if I mentioned before, income per professional employee, you have a very top heavy firm. You would expect to have more money per professional employee than a firm with uh, a lot of juniors. So that this, this is two indicators right. that are going to lead us. If, by the way, if we're just going to follow those two, we're usually going to be a profitable firm. But there is a lot of other indication, in, indicators. For example, utilization. How much billable hours mm -hmm. should I expect from architect? By the way, it's not the same number in, in, in uh, uh, New York, in London, and Tel Aviv. It's not the same number because law firms are, uh, uh, and the uh, work law are, are, are different. Thing, other things, cultures are different, and all those kind of things. So you need to know what is the number. Yeah. If I'm producing less billable hours, then my colleagues have an issue. It's an efficiency issue. I can earn more employee, but just fixing processes of how to be more efficient. So this is mm -hmm. a few of them. Yotam, can you think of them? Yeah, I, I, I think first of all, when we talk about KPIs or metrics, as Lior said, it's it's not, can be like a number in, in like a vacuum. It's gotta be versus the benchmark versus the industry. Because um, we some we have a lot of firms that sometimes say, oh, we know all of our numbers, but we don't know what they mean. Okay, I know what my number is, but what does that mean? And as Lior said, it depends on, you know, in the US, for example, it varies by cities, you know? There's different numbers you need to make. And sometimes it's a challenge because, you know, we can have a firm in New York or in Boston or in Chicago that they're working on the same projects, right? But their cost structure is different. Um, Mm -hmm. And and I think you have to understand those versus the uh, the benchmark. The second, as you said, the revenue per employee, technical employee, is, is a key one. Um, obviously, along with a profit margin. So, for example, um, we would have you know if we have a low profit margin in a firm, and now we found out that their revenue per employee is high, our client will be, oh yes, that's awesome. We have a high metric or per employee. But wait a minute, if you have this high metric and your profit margin is still low, that's not a good thing. That's actually a problem. I'd rather you have a low revenue per employee than, than, than have a high one because we know we can improve you, right? But I don't know if you're at your ceiling at your revenue per employee and you're still not profitable, then it's a structural issue. And that is, right. and that is like a bigger uh, dip. A lot of times we have a low profit margin because the revenue per employee is low. Okay, we need to improve it. There, there are ways to improve it, but there's a cap, right? There's, there's not like, you know, so because we, we have these uh, these numbers, it's got to be looked at the numbers together. We need to, to understand. And again, everything has to be versus uh, the benchmark and versus kind of where you want to go. Well, that that's interesting. You know what you're saying. You're making that point again that it, you can't just look at one number. There needs to be looking at groups of numbers. And again, it's a discipline. And again, the benchmarks are going to make sense depending on what the goals are of the business and where the business wants to be uh, moving. Yeah, towards. and, and again, we we have like sometimes we we have like an engineer company that uh, they, there's all the surveys or all of these ratio and all of it. And then like you know, come to me was like, we're doing great. All of these ratios that I have, I'm like one of the best, always very, very high, other than one, which is the profit margin. And I'm like, well, that's the one. That's the one that's important, right? All of the others are supposed to lead you there. So if you are, all of these are, you're, you're high, then there's, a, there, there's an issue. And as I said, a structural issue is usually harder to fix or it's a more mm -hmm. big, uh, a big fix a lot of the time or most of the time, 95% of the cases that we are seeing that we start working with new firms, their ratios are low. Their net revenue is yeah. low. Um, and as I said, co a lot of different factors compared to the benchmark, because sometimes you'll say, well, I've been doing this for 40 years and these are my numbers. I'm meeting the same numbers I did 40 years ago or 30 years ago, 20 years ago. That doesn't make it okay. That doesn't make it like right. That's the fact you're doing. If you are losing money or you made a mistake or uh, something wrong 30 years ago, it doesn't make it right the fact yeah. you were doing it. Um, mm -hmm. And we really believe, uh, we're very passionate about it, that every A&E firm can and should be profitable. Just because mm -hmm. you picked, um, I'll say, a, a job or a position that, or, or, you know, uh, that, that, is, that is designed that you love to do, 
doesn't mean you not you shouldn't be profitable because um, I think yeah. sometimes they're saying, well, I went to design school, I like design, it's okay that I'm not making money. We're we're against that <laughs> thinking. You're doing a valuable service to you know to everyone. Um, yeah. It needs to be compensated, and we really believe that everybody should and could be profitable. And, and Ryan, your question about looking on different numbers, it's, it's, it's so true, you know. Sometimes we see that billing is great, we, we even have projects, uh, collection is great, cash flow is wonderful, profit is, 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 everything is great, we're meeting all the numbers, but then we see that utilization and billable hours is going down. It's not low yet, it's going mm-hmm. down. And sometimes this is the first indicator that's gonna tell us in a month or two, we're going to start to have a problem with workload, you know, and this is indicator is, you know, basically everything you look on the, all the numbers are good. Every indicator, it's not, it cannot stand alone. But when you look on different numbers mm-hmm. and you see utilization is going down, but about hours going down per employee and the workload starts to, you know, slowly going down. Maybe we have an issue. We need to look on projection and connect everything with everything. So some, sometimes, you know, one big project is changing the whole pre, uh, uh, picture. You need to look on all those numbers in every given moment. And as you Tom said, compare to the benchmark and compare to what you had mm-hmm. in the past when, uh, when, when we were meeting all, all the objectives. So it's a lot of numbers that you need, a lot of indicators you need to monitor on a real time basis every month and, and to be on top of everything. Let's let's talk about profit for a moment in a little bit more detail because it sounds like a silly question, but how do you define profit? Because when I talk to many when I talk to many practices, there's everyone's got a different description for profit. Some will proudly say we don't make any profit because we reinvest everything back into the business. And there's a lot of miscommunication and sometimes even in the same business, there are different definitions for what profit actually is. And it causes confusion. So how do you how do you deal with with that, or is it something you've experienced? First of yourselves? all, it's a great question. It's really a great question because <laughs> profit is you know it's a term that everybody uses in differently. One of the things that we we try to, when we set up an objective for a firm, we don't call it even profit. Is what is the share of the net revenue that as in, in percentage as percentage for the owners. Okay, because uh-huh. if I take yeah. a salary of eight hundred thousand pound dollars, whatever, and my profit is two hundred thousand pounds of dollars, it doesn't matter if I have a salary of two hundred and profit of eight hundred. So we always look on those two numbers together, and that's mm-hmm. not st- it cannot stand alone because it's very different between a firm of ten people that have five partners or ten people who's one partner. So you, you, you need yes. at the end of the day to understand, uh, we start with the structure and if it's a, let's call it a normal firm, uh, we will look what is the net revenue as a percentage of, of the, uh, what is the net income that of the, as a percentage of the total revenue of, of the firm that the owners uh, gonna have. And Usually mm-hmm. when we start work with a lot of architects that we started to work with, they told us um, we are making money, but we are investing in, in the business. And it's, you can't look it for a long term. It's, 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 you know, at the end of the day, we provide service. So 80% more or less of, of the expenses of 70 to 80%, it's, it's, uh, it's salaries. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so how much can you 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 put into the business as an investment you can buy new computers or or or, or invest in new software that that that's fine and uh, of course you need to inv- at the end of the day you need to invest mostly in your in your people uh, great people get yep. great staff is a super important key and keeping the staff mm-hmm. uh, it's a super important key to keep a, a sustainable profit and if mm-hmm. a firm is investing in the business for 30 years, something here is warm. Yeah, to, to, to Lior's point, the investing part, because the overhead expenses are a big part, a small part, sorry, 
of of the revenue, right? Most of our costs mm-hmm. are salaries, and we can't really reinvest in salaries, right? It's it's an ongoing investment. Uh, but yes, mm-hmm. we can buy computers. We can you know renovate the um, the office. There's there's certain things, but in reality, the only way or reason why a company that's profitable is not really showing cash profit or has collect or cash flow issues is during growth, right? Because we're hiring and hiring because we're doing more and more work. Eventually, obviously, we need to be in a stable place that we're also making making profit. So it's yeah. it's only the case of, you know, we have a lag between we have to pay our staff. Then, mm-hmm. you know, for the work they did in the past month, we pay it, pay it, then we bill for it. And then later we get, um, you know, we get reimbursed for it. So we always have a lag of a few months, but it's not mm-hmm. a lag of years. So we have to make sure that if a company is stable and not growing, reinvest is very minimal from, from a profit mm-hmm. perspective, which is, for example, why banks would love to invest or love to give lines of credits and loans to growing firms because they're saying, okay, mm-hmm. that's fine. They're growing. Eventually, they're going to be profitable. They're, they're going to pay me. I'm getting the interest now. Awesome. But I also know that my, you know, I don't have a big liability because they're going to pay us back. So it's really um, the reinvestment part is, is really only if it's the company is really is really growing. If not, then that's probably not the reason why you're not profitable. Yeah, yeah there's probably some other yeah, there's probably another deception, reason. <laughs> deception happening. Yeah, regarding yeah. banks, usually they like to give you the money when you have money. When yeah, when you don't need it. Yeah, when you don't need it. Yeah, that's the that's their goal. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, brilliant. Well, I think that's the perfect place to conclude the conversation. There, um, that's been really, really fascinating insights and an amazing set of services that you guys provide. If people want to get into touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, I think it's you know uh, we have our website that uh, you know they can uh, reach out there. Uh, we have our, our our LinkedIn account. We have all of our contact information that we can maybe provide here. Uh, that I mean that's I don't know, Lior. Yeah, maybe we can we can leave a, an I don't know an email address or something, and they can go into our website. Sorry, it's we got we got, we got, we're gonna. We are working on a new one right now. It's not that new. We, we, we're not very proud of it, but it's going to be awesome soon. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's it. No problems. Great. I'll put that. I'll put that information into the details. Leo, your Tam, thank you so much. Thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. It was great being here. Thank you, Ryan. It was a pleasure. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.